I was encouraged on the heels of the upper school retreat. Um, and we covered a lot of topics, and I love seeing the community and how you guys were responding, and I love seeing the worship. I just uh, thoroughly enjoyed our time together. At the retreat, we talked about ordered loves, the objects of our loves, the degrees of our loves, the aims of our loves. We talked about making sure that our outward actions match what our profession of faith is, that there's a danger of hypocrisy when we say we're believers, but yet our words and our actions don't look like it. We talked about the danger of familiarity. And in regards to today, sometimes there is a danger of coming to chapel and you become familiar with it so you don't come with the right attitude. We talked about a heart for God. The central characteristic of a heart for God is its deep, sincere hunger to know and honor God. That's what we're getting after. That's what we all want, to have a heart for God a deep, sincere hunger to know and to honor God. So in our first official upper school chapel of the year, I wanted to build on this, and I want to lay a framework for us to think about the rest of our chapel times together throughout, throughout the year. Why do we come to chapel? And how should we come to chapel? If we had to boil it down to one word, why is it that we come to chapel? The heart of it is the word worship. Well, what does worship mean? Worship is paying homage, a special respect, a special honor. It's an attitude, it's an activity designed to recognize and describe worth to someone. It's worship, that, that's what worship is. It's, it, it comprises both an attitude and also an activity. So when we, when we gather together as an upper school body or as a whole school community, we're gathering together for the purpose of worship. Attitude and activity. To show special honor to God for who he is. Now, we have to pause for a minute. Because to put it within its context, we're coming to give honor to God and we have to think about what that involves. We're coming to pay homage to the one who is sovereign, to the one that is set apart and distinct from all of us, uh, to the creator of the whole world. And because of that, when we come, that demands or dictates that we come with an attitude of respect because he is totally other than us. He's in a category all by himself. This past Sunday, the first Sunday of the NFL season, you saw people excited, enthusiastic to worship, to, to, to really root on, in some cases worship, their team. But the reality is there's a lot of other teams that are similar to them. And while one team may be better than the other, they're all in the same category. When we come to worship, we come to worship God who is in a category completely by himself. So it comes, it dictates that we come with, a, with an attitude of respect. But then on the flip side of that, we recognize that the one that is in a category all by himself is also a loving God who desires to be close to his people. And that closeness is both individual and it's also communal as a, as a group. So there's a sense in our attitude that when we come, we come with respect, but we also come with the sense of intimacy because we're engaging into a worship uh, time where we are engaging in a God that desires to be close to us. So it engages our emotions. Worship is an attitude. It's also an activity. When I look at the scriptures, I see lots of activities associated with worship. Oh, oh, all right. We lost the slides. <clears throat> One of the issues that we see throughout the scriptures 
is we see uh, the activity of bowing down. That there's a humbling of oneself, a bowing down associated with worship. Now think about that. You will see a bowing down uh, that will often happen before kings. Somebody tell me, why does somebody bow a knee before a king? Help me out. Yes. To show respect. And by bowing, what are you also saying? Yeah, yeah, that, that you are in a position above me. And by bowing, I am willing to serve. Here I am awaiting your instructions humbling myself, and ready to do your bidding. So in worship, in the scriptures, that's what we often see, a bowing before the Lord, showing a position of listening and a willing heart of obedience. So my charge to you, one of the charges to you as you come into these chapel services throughout the year is that you come with that similar attitude with the attitude of bowing low, with the attitude of saying, here I am, I'm willing to listen to what you have for me to do, Lord, and I'm willing to obey. One of the other activities is jubilation. In the scriptures, you see an internal and an external symbol of devotion and enthusiasm honoring God. That enthusiasm uh, is, is often seen in dancing, it's seen in the use of a tambourine. Remember when Miriam in Exodus uh, chapter 15, after they had crossed over the Red Sea, Miriam gathers the people together and she uses a tambourine and leads them in dance and song and praise. And the people sing together. Now that looks differently for different cultural groups. Some of you may express that differently than others. In some cultures, it's very festive, very emotive. In others, not as much. But whichever way we look at it, that's, that's what the Lord is looking from us, to engage an attitude of devotion and enthusiasm to honor God. So if you are at a football game, you see a lot of enthusiasm. When we come in to sing the Lord's songs, there should be some enthusiasm. We should sing them enthusiastically. So in the aspects of worship, we see bowing down, we see, see jubilation, uh, we also see sacrifice. And we worship as a Christian community out of gratitude for what God has done for us and what Jesus did for us at the cross. The cross epitomizes the ultimate sacrifice. And it's in light of the cross that Paul says in Romans 12, therefore... In, in light of the fact that, in fact, in Romans 1 through 3, he says, Romans 1 through 3, that all are sinners. No one seeks after God. We all fall short. And in light of that, God has sent his son so that we can be, be made righteous. And in, in, in light of what God has done for us at the cross, we then present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, what Paul says is your reasonable act of worship. So there's a sense of, there's a sense of, of, of sacrifice in our worship. So when we come to chapel, my challenge is that we come with the right attitude, with a willing and grateful heart, bowing the knee. We come in prayer, recognizing that we're coming before a sovereign one, we come singing with an attitude of devotion and jubilation. We receive instruction. In the church, we often see it even, even uh, extra steps in the forms of baptism and the Lord's Supper. But we come, we worship, we receive instruction, and then we go out with a purpose and with a mission. And we started this by reading Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to just have a quick word for us in, talk, in tying this all together. And in particularly, I'm going to 
focus in on verse 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as, uh, as, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The author of Hebrews, writing to a group of Jewish believers that are in the midst of persecution, he says, listen, don't forsake gathering together. You help one another. You encourage one another. As we talked about our ordered loves in, the, in, the, in our time at the retreat, uh, you are ultimately the one that's responsible for your actions and for your ordered loves. But the beauty of that is that you can encourage one another in ordering the proper loves, in having the right ordered loves, the objects of our loves, in, in having the right degrees of our loves, and in the right motivations and aims behind them. My challenge is that we do that with one another. Consider how to spur one another on to love and good deeds. How do we do that? Let's go out and do that today. Encouraging one another, spurring one another on to love and good deeds, and specifically in the context of what we had talked about with our ordered loves. <laughs>